You're listening to Cultivation Elevated, hosted by Michael Williamson, where we discuss vertical farming and the future of cannabis and food production. You'll be learning key insights for vertical farming success from leading industry operators, growers, and executives. If you're a grower or owner looking to optimize your existing or new indoor cultivation facility, or anyone looking to cultivate more in less space, we've got you covered. Cultivation Elevated, sponsored by Pip Particulture. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cultivation Elevated, sponsored by Pip Horticulture. I'm your host, Michael Williamson, and I'm here today in Paris, California at Claiborne Co. with Brent Barnes, co-founder and VP of Cultivation. Appreciate you having me and thanks for the tour earlier. Oh, thanks for having me. It really is a pleasure being on this. Yeah, I appreciate it. So tell me a little bit about kind of how Claiborne was born. Claiborne was born with, with real basic mentalities. It was really basic ideas. It was trying to bring good quality product with good quality marketing and branding and really just customer service. We started Claiborne with the idea of the industry needed help with customer service. They needed help pushing a product in a direction that said, hey, this is good quality product, but also we can have a real business that supports you in this aspect. The good quality product was something that it was my other founder, so my other business partner, Nick Ortega, and Jonathan and I, it's like we came together and said, hey, it's like there are gaps in quality here in the market, and there are gaps in customer service with distribution of wholesale product. Um, what year is that? This was 2017, okay. 2018, right around that era. It's like is when we first started talking about starting a business, essentially, because you know it took years to start a business, let alone actually get it running. But the idea was, hey, let's bring a brand. Let's bring a real marketed, branded product. Um, I had a background in marketing. My other co-founder partner, Jonathan Griffith, had a background in branding and marketing and things like that. And Nick, same thing. It's like we'd all worked with other industries and we all enjoyed cannabis, but hey, let's actually bring this to a cannabis industry that was lacking, that was new, that was fresh, that needed innovation. And we started Claiborne. And we started it with a generalized idea that, hey, let's see if we can get this going. Let's see if, if we're batshit crazy or if this is real. And that's just the truth. And we said, let's design a brand. It's like, let's buy some flour from people that we trust. We know farms that we know are cultivating quality flour, essentially. And take it and put it into our jar. All right, white label product. It's kind of how we call that nowadays. It's like, and we went, we search farms, we talk to farmers, we talk to people about everything that we knew and understand about quality of product. I was the only one who had ever grown cannabis and I treated it like a tomato plant. And that's really truthfully how it was. I was a little twerpy skateboarder kid who was smoking weed and decided to grow seeds from his freaking cheap ass dime bag he was buying and that was the first time I'd ever grown. And what's funny about that is that it... How, how old are you? How I was 13. There you go. Yeah, oh, I was 13. See, we have a lot of similarities. Yeah. I got and, one of those stories too. Yeah, I was growing in a river bottom. It's like, and uh, it was just right behind my house. Yeah. Did you um, have a successful crop at 13? No, of course not. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> me neither. But we took it and, and grew. And for me, it was always just another part of life kind of thing. It was just a part of relaxing. It was a part of having fun. Later on, I had kids and things kind of changed a little bit and it turns into a completely different thing. Um, a lot of what got us or got me into it personally after that had to do more with my kids, my wife and things like that, which we can talk about that another day. But Claiborne came from this just idea of let's make this better. Let's take something that you can see is clearly kind of struggling in some areas and let's bring consumerism to it. Let's bring good quality product, good quality customer service and here you go. Here's a good brand. We did it with nickels and dimes too. We bootstrapped everything. It's like none of us were rich kids. None of us had money coming out of our ears. It was just an idea, essentially. We worked two jobs, all three of us. It's like we were working day jobs and then we were doing this at night. And lo and behold, it's like we, we selected good quality flour from people. We knew what we were doing. We smoked obviously what we were trying. It's like, and the brand started taking off it started really selling. That's an important statement that you just said. You were smoking what you were trying. Of course. But uh, it sounds logical, right? But like a lot of people don't. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, that looks good. Or, oh, the price is good. Or There's one thing I will tell you personally for me. It's like if I wouldn't smoke it, 
then I'm not going to put it into my jar. Nice. And that is just the truth. I don't care who you are. It's like if there's something wrong with that product, there's an alternative path for that product. It's like whether it's extraction, whether it's anything, it's like there's so many things you can do with this crop. Don't waste premium product on putting it into a brand and destroying your brand. Amen. You only get one first time to market with that brand too. So, And with the amount of brands that are in California, it's easy to try something and be like, oh yeah, I've had it. It wasn't really good. So, And, and they, they don't go back. Mm -hmm. You have to really like turn the wheel around and have a lot of hype around it and people saying, man, have you had this from them? Because yeah. they've gotten a lot better. But most people, they'll try your brand once and if it doesn't cut mustard, they're done. Yeah, consumerism. It's like it, it really sucks that... The, the industry that I came from, and that's that was the nature of it. It's like, give people what they want. Give people good quality products. They need to be the best. It's like, or competing with the best. Because if they're not, who are you? Before we talk about the infrastructure here at Claiborne, let's talk a little bit about you. You have a really unique background that is very complementary to this industry. And also, it, it must be like a step forward and step back at the same time in some aspects. It was, my background is, what makes me me it's like in all reality and what's funny about it is that every step i took in my career kind of created who i was in many different ways when i went to school believe it or not i was working at a pet store and i thought i was going to be a veterinarian i was like you know i really like animals i had all these snakes everywhere i had every pet known to man ferrets chichillas it's like you named it i had it and it was just it was Weird thing, but just hear me out. I was really into fish tanks. It's like literally fish tanks and I had reef tanks. I started going to college and I was like, hey, you know, I'm gonna be a veterinarian. I'm gonna get a biological degree and I'm gonna take it and go to Cal Poly, one of the Cal Polys and say, I'm gonna be a veterinarian. I went and I took a class. I took a class in botany, all right? And I'm not kidding you, it clicked. It was like that. And what was funny to me is as a kid, my mom and dad, they separated. I was, I was, I don't know, 10, somewhere around that age, somewhere yeah, like that. Yeah, tough age for all that. It's like, and my mom went back to work and my grandmother took care of me. My grandmother took care of me. My grandmother was the most avid gardener you can imagine. It's like you'd walk into her house, it was a jungle. It was just like everything under the sun from epiphyllums to orchids all over the place to flowering plants. It's like, and, and she lived for plants. And as a kid, I sat there and gardened with her every day. And she made me breakfast. My mom would leave, take care of my brother and I, essentially. And she was working. She was a, a teacher's aide at the time. And my brother and I, my brother was old enough to kind of do his own thing. And my grandmother took care of me. And I gardened. And truthfully, I never really thought anything about it when I was younger. How much fun it was. Like, teach me how to vegetable garden and teach me how to cut shrubs and do all these things. Sure. It's like growing up around flowers. And then I took that botany class and I was like, I love this. I love what I'm learning right now. What, do you remember like what it was specifically? Um, truthfully, at that time, it was actually just a general hort. So it was like the beginning of botany. And it was taught by Jody Holt, which I think at one point in time was a chair of the department and different things. But she was just a happy person. She was easy to, to listen to and talk and stuff like that. But it was just about general growing techniques is all it was. It was like how, to, how plants grow their physiology and morphology. I wonder if you would have had a different teacher, if you would have had a different experience. You know, life chooses its own way. That's right. It's like the paths are kind of given to you in different scenarios, so. So you got bit by the botany bug mm -hmm. when you're in, what, your freshman, sophomore in I college? I was a sophomore in college. Okay. It was taken as like a general ed course. And that was UC Riverside? Yep, University of California, Riverside. Okay. And what's funny about it is I took it, and then I was like, hey, I really like this took another course and another course. And I finally ended up meeting another person. And his name was John Smith, as, as crazy as it sounds. But that was his name. And he was actually a sub. And he was like, hey, I know some people in the botany department. You know, they're friends of mine. He was like, do you want a job? And it led to meeting two different people that I got jobs with. A, a person named Giles Waynes, who managed breeding. He was a plant breeder. And he bred wheat and penicillin and all these different types of grass. But he also bred ornamental plants. So pretty flowering things, all right? And he was like, I'm gonna introduce you to another person I know, Robert Kruger, who worked for the USDA. And he worked in citrus and dates, all right, at the germplasm repository. And at the time, I didn't know I was gonna be a breeder. I had no clue. I was just trying to work with plants. But what was funny about it is that those two things, working for a germplasm repository, which is like a seed storage bank mm -hmm. for plants, and then working for a plant breeder, 
pretty much turned me into the person I am today as a plant breeder through many different facets. Um, I worked for both of them as a student for a couple of years apiece kind of thing, and I actually worked both jobs at the same time. Um, both of them were just student jobs. They were three, four, five, six hours a week. Man, compared to most student jobs people are doing, like flipping burgers and tacos and waiting tables and stuff, I mean, you couldn't so ask fun. for a better situation to set you up for future success. Yeah, looking at pretty ornamental plants and then looking at citrus, it's like any of the every type of citrus known to man, it's like it was, it was a godsend. Was that one of the first times you like really identified with like a mentor? Very much so. Giles Wayne was, was uh, very much my first mentor. And I appreciate him more than anybody because he was very, well, once again, laissez-faire. He was just like calm. He was working with a crop called salvia. Um, he worked with quite a few different crops, delphinium and lilac and salvia gregii microphylla. But he, another funny thing is that he had a specific color of salvia gregii that was a mutation found in Mexico. What, color, what color is that? It was yellow. Okay. It was a yeah. yellow, yellow salvia gregii. And he was a part because he managed the herbarium and he managed the botanic gardens there. Mm -hmm. And he just happened to have it. And he was like, hey, Brent, I want to cross this with all this stuff. And he showed me essentially how to do population crosses and hybrid blocks. Then he also showed me just, hey, this is how you hand pollinate these crops that are hummingbird pollinated. But he started like this new mentality and he was like, you're going to create new colors with this. And at the time, once again, I was like, cool, this is fun. Totally. Um, we were working with interspecifics, which are hybrids between two different species, okay, in the same genus. Mm -hmm. And I was working with this in salvia. He introduced me the same thing with delphinium, with red colored delphiniums, hybridizing them with blue colored delphiniums. And lilacs was just like, here you go, Brent, here's some mess with heat tolerant lilacs, which out here in Southern California is nearly impossible. But it led down all these different paths and made me so interested with innovation that it, I was my 100% my focus. I started collecting different species of salvias and all these different things. That was the first time I had grown cannabis in like a larger scale because I had greenhouses now set up in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time I had a friend of mine I was working with, it was like, hey, I'm growing weed. And I was like, hey, can you give me some cuts? Like, I haven't grown it in a long time. I kind of want to grow it like as a real gardener. And I grew it in a hot house in my backyard. I had six plants and that was the first successful crop. And this was, I was 19, 20 maybe. Sounds about right. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> so then yeah. you have these incredible mentors. You go down a botany path or what, what, what was your end degree when you, when you graduated? End, what, what? Everything was biological sciences or plant biology okay. at UCR. It's like... The university system is so much different than the Cal Poly system. University system is always like, well, you get a generalized plant biology or plant microbiology or something like that. And then if you want horticulture or agronomy or something like that, you go to a more of a trade school like Cal Poly Pomona, Cal Poly Slow, something like that. I was one of those guys at that school. I was like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I, when I graduated. I wanted to work with plants and the USDA was, was looking to fill a greenhouse position, like a greenhouse tech position. I had been there for a couple of years by then and they were like, hey, you should apply. And I applied and I ended up not getting the job because a veteran came in and got the job over me because they have veterans preference. And I was okay with that. And it led to me getting a job with, believe it or not, another, another professor who put me through grad school for free. So it was a professor who was breeding interspecific turf grass and he was doing trials. So R&D agronomy trials for chemical companies, Bayer, Syngenta, Monsanto. They all, whenever you label something on a chemical label, they require you to do localized data. So they collect their localized data so they can say, you can use this in Southern California on Bermuda grass. And I did that for him. And that was my first real job with a degree. And at the same time, it was a graduate student researcher. Same time, I was a specialist, a junior specialist, paid for my education. Awesome. And I got to breed turf grass. And while I was at it, I still got to breed ornamentals and things like that. Um, and I bred and I did field agronomy trials and I did, seems like hundreds upon hundreds of different field agronomy trials for chemicals and fertilizer, and fungicides and everything that we all hate in this industry. <laughs> but it was just the truth. And it paid for what it was. And then one day, out of nowhere, I was like, you know what? I want to be a plant breeder. This isn't taking me in the direction that I want to go for. I'm going to start looking for jobs. 
Um, and I found a job down in Bonzal, so San Diego County, down south. It was like an hour south of me. And it was for a company called Plant 21. And it was Plant 21 LLC, and it was Ornamental Plant Breeder. And I was like, I was like, man, Ornamental Plant Breeder sounds like so much fun. And I get to actually work with interspecific hybrids and breed all these different plants that were listed on there. Like, I'm going to apply for it. I'm never going to, never going to get a call back. It's like, and they called me back almost immediately. It was like next day. And I called and I interviewed and I had this cheap, shitty suit, you know, and I had a nursery at home. I was still growing all the stuff. And all I cared about was innovation, was creating new things. I ended up getting that job. And I, to this day, I was like, how did I ever get that? I, like, I'm not, a, I wasn't a plant geneticist at that time. You know, I hadn't, hadn't been a plant breeder really. I was just a student and What's funny about it is, is I got that job and my first true, not really true, but my first real mentor, very specific mentor is who I met at that job. And it was a, a gentleman named Ushio Sakazaki. He was a Japanese plant breeder. I got that job and I didn't have any clue what it was. And I show up at this huge 80 acre greenhouse facility that they rented property from and they grew all ornamental starts is all they did. It was a company called Euro American Propagators um, that was owned by a company called Proven Winners. Ah, uh, yeah, there we go. So Proven Winners had three nurseries that they owned um, nationwide and Proven Winners is an international company and every Home Depot, Lowe's Garden Center has Proven Winners plants. Um, I didn't know at that time that that's what I was going to be doing, but Plant 21, there was two breeders at the time. I was the third. They hired one other, one other person with me. Um, controlled over 40% of Proven Winners catalog, and Proven Winners is a huge company. And that breeder, Ushio, he hired me because I had worked with interspecific hybrids. Specifically that. Um, because I had experience hybridizing two different species of plants, which is not normal, by the way. Most of the time when, when you hear about a plant breeder, they take Here's a blue petunia. Here's another blue petunia. I'm gonna cross together. Like in, super blue petunia. Yep. And in cannabis, it's the same thing. I'm gonna take this cake and I'm gonna cross it with this sunset sherb. Those aren't different species. Same exact species. We're just hybridizing them. What we did was we went into the wild. We collected wild species internationally. This I have to be careful when I'm talking about this stuff sometimes. Sure, but, a little sensitive. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we worked with herbariums. We worked with a lot of different companies, a lot of different universities, and stuff like that. And we would collect wild species and bring them back into the United States and hybridize them with inbred lines that were naturally created by people who I just talking about breeding a blue petunia with a blue petunia. They're creating inbred lines for us that are very stable for blue petunia. And I would hybridize them with wild species and create a completely new innovative product. And, and how stable was that after that first well, cross? Well, true F1s, your, your whole population is usually different. But Ushio, my mentor, had made a full business off of regenerating vigor from plants and re-innovating inbred lines from that. Proven Winners was, was a company that was built off of taking cuttings during a time when seed was the only way to propagate a lot of this stuff. And what they did was his breeding actually, it selected things and innovated them so much that people thought they were different types of plants. So taking a petunia. Just because of that hybrid vigor? Mm -hmm. Just Which because of heterosis? It's heterosis. Well, heterosis, yeah, technically is reverse sometimes. But okay. it's that hybrid vigor was so different that people were like, wow, I've never seen a petunia like that. It's kind of like when you see um, a diseased cannabis plant and then, you know, you see a tissue culture cannabis <laughs> plant of the same, same variety and you're like, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like? Yeah. And it can be completely different. It was huge at that time. It was in the early 80s. And he had started doing, he did it with verbena and calabrocoa and all these other pretty crops that you see all over the place. But that one thing changed my whole mindset on everything I'd ever done. It's like that one concept that nobody even thinks about is true innovation, what it is. And taking it and hybridizing things and finding a plant that no one has ever seen before. Even differences in species. It's like most people think like, oh, it's a plant species. It could be any species. Oh, they're all the same. That's kind of what we're taught. A plant or a species in general is a very, is a similar thing. Okay. When they don't look at us as humans, like we're all the same species. Sure. And we're all very, very different. Why can't plants be that same way? And that one 
mind. One logical thought process changes the way that you breed plants for the rest of your life. It changes the way you look at things. It's like everything is bred. Almost everything we see is bred. Even the weeds technically are bred. They're bred for our region. Maybe natural, but... Yeah, it's a more of a natural selection. Mm -hmm. So, and that led me down my path of everything. It's like it literally turned me into, I, I ended up becoming the director of plant breeding to close this off and stop talking about plants. I apologize. But it's... Oh no, we're not done talking about plants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good. we're just getting started. But it's, it changed the way I viewed things. It changed the way I looked at a lot of different things. And when, to bring Claiborne back into this, I ended up moving up in the ranks at that company. There were three of us. We ended up with three different breeders. We competed against huge companies like Syngenta, Bayer, Monsanto for breeding programs. Mm -hmm. Three of us competing against teams of 50 to 100 breeders sure. with molecular lab techniques that they were able to do whatever the hell they wanted. We were just classical genetics breeding wild species. For people that are listening, because we have talked about some, some high level dialogue, but can you explain the differences between classical breeding and like advanced genomic breeding? So classical geneticists are really what we call pollen pushers. It's like we're taking, like in our situation with cannabis, we take a male plant and a female plant. It's like take those plants and hybridize them together. We have a seed population, then we evaluate that seed population for the traits that we're looking for. Those traits can be anything. It could be disease tolerance, it could be flavor, it could be trichome coverage, density, it doesn't matter. Those are classical things. It's like, and we're visually looking at them just by hybridizing male and female plant parts, all right? Most of the time they're perfect plants or perfect flowers, so they have male and female parts on the same, which is majority of flowers in this world. Cannabis is dioecious, so cannabis is very special in this situation because there's not many dioecious plant groups in the world where they have male and female plants. Monoecia sometimes where you have male and female flowers, it's like, but you still tend to have one plant with both parts on it. Cannabis is fully different. Now, when you have genomic breeding, it's like any type of molecular breeding, those molecular scientists have taken a population usually of plants in a gene pool and they say, okay, I have phenotyp phenotypically labeled this on this part of the population and I have phenotypically labeled this on this part of the population. I'm gonna go look into the RNA sequences and the DNA sometimes, but the sequences of these plants and say, these plants have these genes that are always different than these plants, all right? Then they spend a whole bunch more time honing this in, because you can do that over and over and over. And this is just simplistic terms, by the way, guys. There's so many more ways to do this, but then I'm gonna find this plant and I'm gonna label that. All right, label could mean anything. Label could actually mean like a physical marker or something sure. like that, like and, coloring. And, you, and you're or labeling or identifying traits or <laughs> markers? Technically it's markers. Markers is it's the like, right word, I think, right? Traits is a hard thing because technically they're the same thing. Like you personally have given the trait that the marker is attached to. It's not always 100% though. It's sometimes it's like, oh, you know, hey, I gotta do a little bit more research. And that usually goes into the next generation. Like it, it, molecular breeding can't be just molecular. It has to be classical and molecular. Because a lot of the times when you're marking things or when you're labeling something, you find it and you're like, hey, there's still, the data's still a little cloudy. Let me make a more inbred line that separates it even more and let's do the same exact thing we just did, but let's do it again. And eventually what you do is you create a genetic marker that truly does mark a trait that you're looking for or an expression or anything, it doesn't matter. Um, some type of gene pool that gives you something. And once those markers are identified, then you can do marker assisted then breeding? Then you can do marker assisted breeding, exactly. And that marker assisted breeding, that's, it doesn't always work because then, then you have complex situations where sometimes it, that marker is the same for everything and sometimes it's only for certain subgroups or something like that, but it still works. Is really what it is. And is the idea that with marker-assisted breeding that you can get to your end breeding goal? Because each breeding project has a breeding <laughs> goal that's established up front, unless so, you're just a wild no, pollen no, no. chucking, you know, and let's see what happened. I was on the classical side of things. Mm -hmm. It's like I dealt with molecular breeding techniques mostly for patent infringement and stuff like that. I'm a classical geneticist. Let's just kind of, that's who I am. That's how I was trained. And I just happened to train in a field where innovation was still something very common. In ornamental plants, you could breed a wild species with an inbred line. You could still get true innovation without any marker-assisted breeding. 
period, dot, dot. And that's what we did. Whereas other companies like Ball Horticulture, one of our biggest competitors, they had full labs where they did do marker-assisted breeding, and it helps. Is the advantage is that you can get to your end goal faster? faster. That's right. It's like, I, mm -hmm. like in layman's terms, for simple-minded folks like myself, I, I refer to it as like speed breeding. It's Sometimes it is, but there's a cost associated with it. So it also, the, the biggest telltale, like the biggest thing that, that I always explain it to people, it is faster breeding. It truly is. There's nothing wrong with that. But you have to remember that marker is only marking a trait that you found. What if you're looking for something that's not found? Yeah, you could totally miss it. Well, you don't even know. Yeah, exactly. There is no marker for it. Sure. It's Makes like, sense. so it's one of those things where I, I worked in a field where innovation was 100% of everything, where I was looking for new novel hybrids, whereas marker assisted breeding is more for those people that I was talking about earlier, blue times blue equals blue. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like if that's inbreeding and you're going to get more powdery mildew issues with that, but there just happens to be a marker for powdery mildew tolerance, that type of breeding goes hand in hand. It's like, and it's a mixture once again of classical and marker assisted breeding. There are, I will say, a lot more, there's more to this nowadays than there used to be. It's like CRISPR, for instance, adding genes to I something. I was kind of hoping we could touch base yeah. here a little I, bit. I am not a CRISPR expert, but it makes very good sense being able, like I was more of the gold particle blasting era, where it's like, I'm going to add this vector and I'm going to blast the hell out of this plant with gold particles until it just accepts it, you know, and absorbs it into its sequence. I was of that era. CRISPR came later in my life sign, but the idea of simply, it's almost just like pressing a button and adding something to a plant. For someone that's not familiar with CRISPR-Cas mm -hmm. technology um, or gene editing, is mm -hmm. that the right way to say that? Can you just give a simple term of what gene editing mm -hmm. kind of consists of? Truthfully, I may not be the best person for this. As far as my knowledge goes, what it has to do is you insert with a primer essentially and that primer just adds it into the dna and in the sequence that it needs to be added into and that's the stuff that it's complicated you need to be a molecular scientist well it's not but, just for plants because mm -hmm. I, I used to go to um pag mm -hmm. plant animal genome down in san diego conference and i was the dumbest person in the room and it felt great um because <laughs> i was like wow look at all this stuff and i was just there for the cannabis segment but i would stay and listen to the other stuff and i mean the stuff they're doing with that's what they're talking about with humans, animals. I mean, like kind of designer babies, essentially. Like you want a kid with blue eyes and blonde yep. hair and these traits, like that's a possibility. It's, it's potentially. very, you're hearing about it already. Like even I have companies that are, just this month, I have a meeting with somebody who's approaching me on these same topics. Because it in cannabis, it makes total sense to me. It's like, imagine in cannabis, you were like, hey, I have this plant that's perfect, but it doesn't produce this flavor profile. And you just happen to be able to say like, okay, I want to add alpha pinene to this plant because it's missing it. But the sequence can just be blown into a, a portion of it. And all of a sudden you have a plant that's producing the same terpenes plus alpha pinene. It's like it almost, truthfully, it makes a lot of sense that you would use it for cannabis. It does make a lot of sense for cannabis to me as well, even though it seems like an unnatural thing. And I imagine as a traditional geneticist, it's probably a little cringy, but most people, when they say, like, I've got a winner, it checks all the boxes. I find that's, like, almost never the case. It checks a lot of the boxes, but it doesn't check all of them. No. You and, know? And then the best, some of the best stuff that has some of the highest demand, as we were talking about earlier, yeah, it's heady. It checks flavor profiles and all this stuff, but it doesn't yield. Yeah, 100%. It's like we were talking about earlier, too, with populations. It's like, you know, I'm used to germinating millions of seeds to find something. Whereas in cannabis, it's like we don't have the luxury of germinating millions of seeds. Well, at least we don't, Claiborne. M most but people don't. It's like even if I want to germinate 10,000 seeds, you know how much labor and time and cost goes into this. And it's like the truth of the matter, the thing that I find the least of is agronomy. Just basic agronomic things. It's like how well does it grow? How well does it root? How fast does it start and veg? It's like all of these things are what matters most to me. And then latter ends, it's like right now, sadly, our wonderful industry, it's like, is THC high enough? Is it beautiful enough with trichome density? Is it dense enough? Is it colored? Does it have the right flavor? And I feel that real advanced breeding is coming. It needs to come because we need to better the industry. But it's still, we're still dealing with a lot of issues. I was talking about OGs with you and the issues I have with growing OGs sometimes. And most people, 
<laughs> exactly, right? But the reality is, is can we breed an OG that's easier to grow? It's like, and the answer is of course. Yeah, like I would want to breed, like my breeding goal for OG would be like resistance to lodging, you know, um, some kind of like increased turgor pressure or some, something, you know, because it seems to be one that just needs a lot of traditional support. Yeah, and it's... Very challenging in these mm -hmm. multi-grow environments, oh, 100%. too. Oh, 100%. It's one of the hardest things that I've found to grow in these multi-story And you're things. in Southern California where mm -hmm. you got to be growing some OG. Yeah, well, you're hoping. Yeah. <laughs> it's like... So just transitioning a little bit, let's talk about some of the infrastructure here because I've been to several PIP cultivation facilities and other grow facilities around the world, and you guys are doing something that's quite unique, and you're doing it doing it very well. So can you start to maybe paint the picture for listeners on kind of the, the campus that we're on and some of the infrastructure and buildings and yeah. et cetera. Claiborne, we have two facilities. So we have a single story facility, which is our traditional, it's what we started with. It was our footprint. It's what created Claiborne flower the way it is. And then we have our new facility. Both facilities use pip racks, just so you guys know. It's like our veg at other facility uses two story pip racks. We vegetatively grow all of our mother stock, all my breeding stock, everything going into vegetative sessions or vegetative uh, growth cycles. We've seen that's a new tradition, by the way, not tradition, sorry, word, but it's a new, mm, not sure the word I'm looking for, pattern maybe, um, but people are, you went from these growing these big mothers, right, single tier, to now growing grow two small. tiers, mm -hmm. small, medium size, cycle them out a yep. lot more. Cycle them out, we cycle out every four to six weeks across the street, so we have anywhere oh, from nice. three to four sets of mother stock. It's like, really, you, you're not, you're not cut, uh, clone to kill, are you? You're pretty close. Though. No, we're pretty close. We have to be because we run at four and a half feet across the street. So mm -hmm. the mother stock can't get as big as what we want it to. But the mother stock still gets big enough. It still grows for about two months before we harvest. Well, what would you say are some of the benefits that you see with um, having a two tiered mother room versus a, with medium size, small to medium sized mothers versus um, a single tier with a larger mother, older mother? For us, Believe it or not, we made the decision because of flowering square footage. We added, by doing this, we added a whole nother room of flowering canopy. So even in a single story operation, it made fiscal sense, it made perfect fiscal sense. I'm sure the, mm -hmm. yeah, the return on mm -hmm. investment was first harvest with that yeah, idea. Exactly. Yeah. The mother stock itself, the mother stock itself, it's like you do find, and, and may not want to keep this out of here, but it's like what I found, you do get smaller cuttings. You get thinner cuttings, less stem diameter when you grow them as small as we do. That's why we have to cycle them so much. Mm -hmm. We cycle them more frequently because it gives us the stem diameter, the cutting that we need to produce a successful crop. So the reality is for us though too, it also allows us to watch for virus a little bit more frequently because if you're cycling your mother stock out frequent, guess what? You get to throw things away more frequently, meaning you get to keep clean stock. We do work in tissue culture, so I bring in new tissue culture mother stock every three months okay. at both facilities. Nice. But the reality is, is that you still deal with virus. It's like, it's kind of hard to hide sometimes. Um, we purchase in nursery stock. We still do. We're a large farm. I work with people. I like working with other farms. I have a mentality that I don't want to do this alone. It's like, why should you when other people are successful too? Well, in California, it gives you that privilege. Some of these other states, you're not allowed to do these types of things. I remember when I was growing in California, I was like, you can sell a teenage plant? And someone was like, you can sell a ready to flower plant. And I was like, what's a ready to flower plant? You know? And they were like, yeah, basically you just get the whole plant, it's already veg free, and you flip it into flower. I was like, that's a thing? Because most places are like two inch you know, substrate, and then they'll generally restrict you on height, like eight inch clone. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Which totally. states, all states are like that? A lot of them. Colorado is one mm -hmm. like that. That was a big one growing up. Um, a lot of them are that way. They have a restriction on the height of clone. That would be really hard. You just end up prematurely topping clones mm -hmm. if they, you know, it's, it's a mess. In our Excuse situation, cause given that I came from a company, Euro American Propagators, it's mm -hmm. like where all they did were starts. It's like they did starts and they did four inch pots. It's like it makes, if somebody can do something faster than you and cheaper than you, and you can take that square footage and turn it into a flowering canopy, why wouldn't you? I mean, some of the biggest players in the world don't, they don't, they buy their starts from Holland or they buy their starts from anywhere. Nobody uh, does. Yeah. In, in ag, at least, nobody yeah. really propagates their own stuff unless they're smaller, unless it's like a specialty crop or something like that. Almost everything is purchased out. Yeah, um, you're, either, you're either working in starts or you're, you're, you know, you're in that veg kind of, mm -hmm. or finishing a crop in some cases. Right. Our facility here, we ended up doing three story. Three story crops or three story flowering crops, and they're. And when you say three story, you mean three tiers three, of racking. Three not tiers a three of racking. Building. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. I'm just clarifying um, for my own. 
three tiers of racking and the rooms are, are very large. And we had a lot of opportunity to do single story, double story, triple story, or triple tier, sorry, single tier, double tier, triple tier, lots of different options. And we evaluated so many different things. And a lot of it comes down to fiscal. You, in the end, it comes down to money. And I'm sorry, but it's just kind of true. And I'm an ag guy, cost of production matters. A lot of what we do in this industry and in cannabis, if, if you're not thinking that way, you need to be thinking that way because it does matter. People, we hate talking about it, but if you're growing something for a thousand pounds and the bulk market is selling it at a thousand pounds, well, your business isn't gonna be very successful. But the reality is, is we chose to do three tier for a lot of different reasons and it was hard. It was a hard decision because I had to be the person to evaluate why. I was the grower. I was the person coming into a situation who had single tier, two tier, but I had never done triple tier. Okay? I had worked with people who did. I had worked with people who did who shut down their triple tier. It's like because it didn't work. Same reason that, funny, is the same reason we were talking about earlier is there's too much canopy in the room so they can't control temperature, humidity properly. But, well, so real quick to, to sorry to interrupt yeah. you, I find it so fascinating when people are like, oh, double, multi-tier doesn't work or triple tier doesn't work. I mean, we've seen five tiers. It is never a function of the racking or trays not being the issue. It is always 100% the mechanical engineering and design associated with the is, HVAC system. It is crazy. If you go into a triple tier or even a two tier, a double tier scenario, and if you're not thinking about your airflow or you're not thinking about the load capacity of your dehumidification, your load capacity of your cooling, which is also your dehumidification. It's like you have all of these things that help you grow stable, constant, keeping your room temperature constant. Anytime you have a fluctuation in temperature, humidity, any type of these controls, guess what? You're gonna have issues. It's gonna happen naturally. It's like, but the reality is, is that if you take the time to design your facility, guess what? You don't get those issues. We, we spent a very long time designing our facility, going to farms. Well, and the reason, well, so you coming, I would say, slightly late into the market mm -hmm. in California was a blessing because you got to see a lot more. Like some of the earliest innovators in multi-tier, they were doing it for the first time and there wasn't a lot of places to go check out or they didn't have a lot of like homies they could call and say, hey, like you guys are doing this over there, right? And there, you know, it just wasn't that information share, the, the ability to go tour something. You know, this, this world that we live in now in cannabis is so different than it was five, 10, 15 years ago. And it's really been brought out of secrecy and put into kind of like a more mainstream, more horticultural style. Like well, now it's controlled welcome. environment. Totally, that, it's is, like that is the game. CEA, it's controlled environment ag is, it always has been a thing, but now it, really is cannabis is this now. And there's a lot that we can learn that's already on the market. There's a lot we can learn from people who have done it. It's like, and like what you're saying, I have people that I can go to and say, hey, you know, what would you do? Have you seen this? How was it done? If I had to do this without any help, I, trust me, I would have cried too. It's like, is it would have been crop loss. Well, it's just tough, you know, you're like second guessing yourself in the early days. You're like, am I crazy? You know, am I, you're just beating your head against the wall trying to figure something out. And it, sometimes when you're so tied to your operation, you just need those outside eyes. And it's like you can't see what's right in front of you sometimes. So it's so valuable to have the right relationships that you can bring people in that you trust and respect uh, as far as their opinion goes. And then, you know, you can go visit stuff these days. I mean, it's a whole different world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even with our design, it's... Visiting farms was probably one of the biggest things that helped. It's like visiting other farms and seeing how they were doing it. We can talk about the design really quick if you want to, but it's like everything, everything that we chose to do with the triple tier development was either from me going to a farm and seeing something I didn't like, or going to a farm and seeing something I was like, yes, that makes sense. We chose, so we chose to do triple tier. We chose to do six feet of growing space minus the lighting, which was right around five and a half feet. So you're 18 foot tall-ish rack, right? 18 and a half, I think. 18 and a half. Um, we end up cutting off six inches, I was telling you, because of fire safety yeah. stuff, which, by the way, anybody listening to this, always get your fire marshal involved. I really, really promote it because 
Right now, there's not a lot of code for what we do, but if they ever decide to make code for it, if you didn't get them involved in the beginning, then you risk a lot of things. There's a lot end. of nuanced differences between local municipality, mm -hmm. fire chiefs. Yeah. Um, they're now communicating a little bit better, but what might be okay in one county is not okay in another county. So I can <laughs> agree with that comment more. Yeah. Save yourself some headaches. Do you guys have any big challenges with the CCC, California Code Check? No, it's like everything lucky, we ended up doing. Dog. Yeah, we ended up doing an alternative means and methods submittal okay. for it. Okay. So and it went directly and and it was approved. It's like because. You can't, it's hard because there is no code. There's no code for moving racks. It's like, well, there is, but not for what we use them for. It's like, and the systems that are involved with the moving racks have pivot points that are too new in fire safety where they're like, I don't know if I trust this, so this is the best way based off of what this is. With yeah, it's flu, like a fear thing, yeah. so they just throw it all mm -hmm. at you, right? So it's like they tell you flu spaces and tell you access fire control with water and all that type of stuff, which, you need to have somebody who can support that these systems do not catch on fire. I'm sorry, it's like not these systems. It's like when you have HIDs on plastic, that's a different, because they get way hotter than LEDs yeah. on the trays that we deal with. Um, and it's, it's always grow by grow. So it doesn't matter what I say, it's your grow and how it works. But after doing everything and doing the actual analysis, we built out models, fiscal models, it's like financial models that said, if we do single story, this is what we will get annually. If we do double tier, this is what we will get annually. If we do triple tier, this is what we will get annually. This is how much square footage we have to use. This is how much square footage we have to use for this and this and this. This is the cost per square foot for this, cost per square foot for this, and cost per square foot for this. There's some things in this though, if, if you understand financial models, you're gonna start understanding what's happening. It's like any time you're factor, adding a factor to something that doesn't necessarily increase the cost of other things, guess what, you're saving money per square foot. A lot of people don't understand that's like for every tier that we went up, our cost of production went down. Okay, that's kind of basic stuff because it's like you have more plants in a room. Let's talk about one of those rooms real quick so it gives people some stats because yeah, I'm, I'm sure you got your stats. No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm loving everything you're saying. It's, it's really interesting. So you have a, I'm trying to remember, how, how many square feet is the actual room itself? The room itself is, is right around about 2,100 square feet. Okay, and then how much canopy would a single tier be in a room like that? A single tier would be right around, it's essentially 1,200. It would be right around 1,200 square feet. Okay. So there's 3,500 and some change square feet in each room mm -hmm. of canopy, flowering canopy with the design that so we have. So you essentially created a whole additional thousand plus square feet of canopy yep. in the same exact same space because you were able to have tall ceilings in this building and maximize cubic footprint. Exactly. It's like in the AC design or the mechanical design, just you just kind of add it on as needed. But because you were cooling the same space, Guess what? Also that has reduction in cost because you have scalability now. You have scalability, you can get larger units, even with redundancy in our rooms. And that room has, each flower room has two HVAC units? It has three HVAC oh, three, units. three, that's right. So it has 225s and 140. And 225 ton units, they're Lennox units with added air handle, or added, added heat strips, essentially. And then we have a 40 ton unit up top that's full, you know, it's like pretty much everything in under the sun. And you guys say Addison units. For me, they're Elevate units. Props to Critical Climate on that one. If, if he's listening, you know, he won't listen, but it's just true. And the truth of the matter is, is designing it with the redundancy that we had, it just, instead of having hundreds of, is what it felt like of 12 to 15 ton units on site, it's like the whole rooftop would have been covered with 15 ton units. Yeah, the whole assu assuming the roof space. could support the weight, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it made more sense to do it this way anyway. Because in the end, you get that scalability on the pricing of everything. So you also, once again, your cost of build goes down. Your cost of running, a lot of these bigger units are more efficient. So guess what? Now you get efficiency gains and stuff like that. I actually, I'm a humble person, but I do feel like our design is good. It's like, as it, I haven't had any of the issues that I was told I was going to have. It's like what the rooms do now, like what you guys saw, it's like they dry. They dry too much. It's like, so a lot of my issues are, can I keep the humidity high enough to do what I need it to do? So one of the things I noticed right away with your space is you were very gracious with your front 
what you all will call the front main aisle. So I think you said you had 10 feet there. Yeah. And then more importantly, you have four feet on the back end. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody gets to do that because they're cramming stuff into a smaller space, but you guys have a pretty big space here and you're able to pull that off. And it makes a world of difference in terms of where your returns are located and having that buffer zone on the front and the back end. Can you talk a little bit about kind of how the air flows in your space, where supplies are and where returns are and kind of, of course. the thought process there? Coming from ag, it's like we're working in greenhouses and stuff like that, looking at cyclic airflow in a greenhouse. It's like the design that we used for this was the same way. It was something that I worked with my mechanical engineer very heavily on and saying, hey, I want this type of mentality. And at that, we call it laminar because to me, that's really what it is. It's pushing air in a direction, even though this is you know triple laminar when you start thinking about it. But everything in these rooms, all the supplies, the supplies move all the air to the front entryway. The front entryway is 10 feet. Okay, we did that for a lot of different reasons. It hits a fan, so a, essentially an inline under canopy fan. It hits it and it pushes the air through the canopy and up from the bottom, up right above the pots. Okay, we grow in, in three gallon peat moss, just pots, okay? And the returns on the system are mounted in different spots. So we have returns for the 25 ton units down low and the returns for the 40 ton units are up high. In the, in the back of the On the uh, back, back of, of the yeah. Okay. Really, you have to look at it as one big cyclic airflow is all it is. It's moving in a circle. The reason why we developed that front entryway space, that very first entryway space, is when all that cold air is blowing to the front of the room. Okay. It's very directional. All the supplies are directional straight to the front of the room. All right. It's like a jet engine up there. And what's funny about it is that when you go on the third tier, you really don't even feel any of that airflow because it's directed to blow to the front of the room. All right. It comes to the front and hits the wall and it spins. Okay. And it's mixing the air. And what it's doing is it's gradually mixing the temperatures. It's mixing the humidity. It's doing all that stuff. All right. And the fans, all the under canopy fans are collecting that mixed air and blowing it back through the 48 feet, because we have 48 feet of rows, all right, and the vents are blowing it up into the canopy. It's removing all the microclimate that's created from our peat moss based soils is really what it is. Because peat moss, truthfully, it holds a lot, it holds of, a lot of moisture right there. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, and if you're not careful, it will create a microclimate that will give you powdery mildew issues. It gives you all sorts of wonderful issues. And you okay. mitigate that through irrigation and then... Just irrigating properly. I think is one of the biggest things. Even with our simple facility, irrigating once a day and allowing the dry back to happen accordingly totally helps. Everything's on spitters. It's on just a half gallon emitter is all it is. And each pot has two of them. It irrigates it literally, and you might see a slight bump in relative humidity right after you irrigate, but because the airflow is so cyclic, a couple of points, a couple of percentage points, and it just normalizes it's a flat itself. curve. Mm -hmm. And then you also do some environmental strategic cues when the lights are off. Can you talk a little bit about that? What are you of, talking about? In terms of like, uh, <laughs> in terms of um, running a differential. Oh, running the diff. Well, the diff, so running a diff, there's two ways to look at diffs. It's like we run two different times. So two different types of diff. The differential and temperature, there's a lot of different things. You can drop the temperature. It's like, or you can raise the temperature depending on how you want to manipulate humidity. Or I guess no dip as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's like, and when we're going late into the cycle, using, believe it or not, using Thrive, the reason why you even get a diff in those rooms when the lights turn off, is mostly just because using Thrive, we ramp it down and it naturally controls it with the HVAC unit, cooling the coils. And Thrive is your heating. controller. Thrive is our controlling. So, and using, I've had my, my fair share of non, complicated like controlling systems for facilities where it's just like, here you go, I'm gonna set my thermostat and just do it kind of the best way that you can. And Thrive gives you a lot of luxuries of doing these things. Because we also use a morning diff. So we use a cool time in the morning. We drop early morning temperatures for the first four weeks to kind of, it's to do the same thing, but it also controls the internodal length of plant growth. So by dropping right around about, if you can drop your temperature while the lights, right when they turn on, anywhere from five to 10 degrees below night temperature, it also gives you a, a natural PGR effect, keeping plants shorter. 
So it's a big thing that, truthfully, cannabis growers, I actually, most of those guys probably don't even hear about it, but we use it a lot in the floriculture, use a lot in ornamental plants to control how a plant branches. It's like, cause you want a plant that grows short, stout, and very well branched. Well, it's like if you allow the plant to grow at the rate that we're growing them at, they're just going to be these tall, lanky things all the time. So it's like an environmental PGR it's, or plant growth regulator, mm -hmm. which we know that plant growth regulators from a chemical standpoint aren't allowed in most cannabis yeah. states. Um, so it's an environmental PGR, essentially. Very much so. And they tend to help us a lot with growing height in our rooms, at least. It's like because growing things in five and a half feet of space, it's like some plants can handle that very well, some plants cannot. It's like we deal with that in a lot of different ways too, by using the diff, by using different age of vegetative growth, um, by topping plants accordingly at the right timing. It's like there's so many different factors that you can use. Veg timing height. seems pretty critical in the multi-tiered mm -hmm. space. And you guys run over 30 different varieties, so therefore, yeah. and you haven't even really got to start your breeding projects over no. here to the level that you'd like to be doing them. Not at all. It's like starting up a facility doesn't give you the luxury of having free space. <laughs> it's, it's just the truth. Um, we talked about it earlier, right? It's like, yeah, flying the airplane while you're building it. And I think any grower that's listening to this that's worked in a commercial facility or even at their house, I think they can all relate to that comment because you're always patching something or, you know, if you get a TCO or temporary certificate of occupancy, you're kind of, you're in. But meanwhile, maybe this room that you're growing in is kind of commissioned, but like everything around you is still wide open or exposed or you have different contractors coming in and out. And as we said earlier, for better or worse, like humans are the vector. We're, 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 we're the disease, you know, we're the one, we're the spreaders of the, of, the, of the bugs and issues. And so when you have, you know, strangers in your space who don't take the same level of care to things like PPE, it causes problems. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's frustrating because you're like, you got investors you gotta listen to and answer to and your hands are tied and you got this situation and you're like, this is about as good as I'm going to be able to get it until you get these people out of my space. It is life as a grower. It's like life as a grower is putting out fires. And sadly, when you have as many employees as we have, as many people entering a room or, or just entering a facility, it doesn't even matter sometimes because they, they see a color on your shirt and that's a thrip. You know, coming in and looking at your at your shirt and saying, "Hey, I thought it was a flower, but now now I have a whole room of them." So no yellow, no yellow and blue shirts at the facility. Yeah, I wish, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. But the reality is, is that we all deal with it. You know, we all deal with bugs. Any grower who tells you they haven't dealt with bugs is is full of shit. Well, and they're probably not a grower at that mm -hmm. point. It's hard to give yourself that title. Speaking of titles, you're not really a grower. No. <laughs> at least really. you don't claim to be, even though you know. I would say you're a grower, but but so can you maybe explain just briefly the difference between a geneticist and a grower? Yeah. And how I, the two are very different? Very much so. It's I am a plant breeder or a plant geneticist, um, a classical geneticist. It's like we've been talking about a little bit. And I've spent my entire career bre breeding plants, breeding plants for a lot of different things, which tends to be agronomic. So Yes, can I be termed a grower sometimes? Yes, to the right people, but would I ever call myself a grower? Never. I would always call myself a plant breeder. And a lot of that has to do with being a plant breeder, you have to breed things that grow. So you have to understand techniques of growers and how growers use different traits or different ideology or different, sorry, to rephrase that, different types of growing techniques for many different reasons, whether that's chemical or fertilizer needs or something like that. You know, I used to breed. Every single crop I bred, actually, you had to breed it for pH tolerance. And people would be like, well, what's pH tolerance? It's like, well, majority of the world deals with a standard growth or a standard increase in pH over a crop cycle. So when you're, when you're selecting something for breeding, you see a lot of high pH nutrient issues that are related with growing inbred crops. And, but you learn very quickly, hey, 5.5 or 6.0 is the right pH that the substrate needs to be or the water soil substrate kind of communication needs to be in order to get the best crop out of this. But would I ever call myself a grower? Sadly, it's hard for me to do sometimes. Um, I deal with the same struggles that any other grower deals with. It's like I ask for help when I need help. 
It's like, I, and this is coming from somebody, I grow many 10,000 square feet of crops, you know? And it's like, I've managed huge greenhouses, but it's not about that. It's like, when I manage huge greenhouses, I had huge teams to support you. And in cannabis, we have to work together like that. It's like, we don't all know what's best for everything, even me. Every time I bring in a new crop, I'm starting on a blank site too. It's like, I'm gonna grow it. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. It's like, but in the end, you're still just somebody growing it for the first time. And it may like our growing conditions, it may not. It's a very hard thing sometimes to cope with is that humble nature. A lot of people when they think about the word strain or cultivar, they think that it's all about the genetics, but the environment plays just as critical of a role in genetic expression as sometimes the breeding does in some cases. Can you talk a little bit about how environment plays a role in trait expression? Very much so. In cannabis, truthfully, cannabis is probably the best example of that. I'm not going to lie. In all the crops I've worked on, I've worked on hundreds of different genres of plants. It's like we bred plants to grow the same no matter where they were grown in the world. All right. And that's, that's a very hard thing to do. It's not easy. And for proven winners, that was a need, uh, necessity for breeding because they had locations in North America, they had locations in Canada, in Europe, in South Africa, in Australia, all these different things. And if they were selling a plant and it didn't look the same in North America as it did in Europe, well, guess what? You're dealing with an issue. It's like, hey, I saw this plant. It's not growing very well. Climate, the amount of light something receives. The humidity that's in your growing region, how, how moist or dry the air is, to just pretty much what you're feeding the plant even sometimes. Or stability of those things. Everything. It's like all of that stuff changes the way that plant grows. And we see that in cannabis. We see it all the time, sadly. We see it when we were talking about ChemD earlier. It's like the ChemD cut that goes around, it's like... It came from a nursery that I get it from, that I had it from a long time ago. And it's like, that cut seems to be the only one that I see around anymore. That plant, under the right conditions, produces a very beautiful, frosty, dense bud. Under a humid condition and a little bit higher light, it produces a little bit what I call larfy or airy type bud. Simple things like that, that's climate, that's growing, and that's also plant breeding. It's like if you can breed a plant that is able to handle all those different types of light and humidity and look the same, guess what? That's plant breeding. Well, ChemD specifically, it's funny you use that, that one specifically because that was a bag seed, mm -hmm. you know? I don't know. I don't know how much stability went into that one in no, the end. Not at all, but... Shout out to Peabud, by the mm -hmm. way, for making that thing stay around for so long. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful plant. Yeah, so and you got, great medicinal effects, too. Mm -hmm. Probably one of our top sellers to this oh, okay. day. Okay, nice. So the reality is, is some of these, some of these things are, are climatic expressions, and some of these things are stability in lines. And the way that I see it is probably a little bit differently than, than most. It's like a genetic expression is not the same thing as like a climate expression. It's like, but genetic stability that gives you climate stability, that's a different thing. It's like, those are two different topics. It's like, cause if the plant's genes are the plant's genes, that's not gonna change the way it looks all the time. Now, if the plant's genes are unstable to the point where it just can't handle humidity, that could be something that might be semi-different. Um, there's a lot of ways that expression that we see of as expression in cannabis is a little bit different. I see it as stabilizing a line to handle multiple different types of climate. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people will just say, well, this plant just doesn't handle multiple types of climate. The same thing almost. It's like, it's, you understand what I'm saying? I no? do. It's I do. like, and that's kind of where a lot of cannabis growers will say, well, the genes are causing it to do this. Well, no, I, I disagree with that. It's like more than likely if you saw it and it looked like this and it was selected in this climate, I would say you just need to grow it in this climate to keep it uniform. You, you triggered a question that I've been <laughs> waiting to ask someone and you're the right person to Maybe. ask especially with your background. So it's not uncommon for cannabis growers to have a cultivar they've been running for a while, and then all of a sudden it just starts to deteriorate for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And this label came out that I never quite agreed with, and I still don't, but I'm curious to get your opinion. Is there such thing as genetic drift? Yes, 100%. I was hoping you were gonna say no. No, I'm sorry. That's all right, tell it's me all about it. Genetic drift, a lot of the times what it has to do with is, is when, you're, when you're clonally propagating something over and over and over again. 
Okay. Sometimes you can have a stress event or sometimes the plant just does it. It's like, and it just creates a mutation. Okay. Would that be poor selection? No, stability. I will tell you stability in, in ornamental crops were the same way over time. Some things just decide that they don't want to be the same. Um, and it's not like disease that we haven't identified. Yet. That is always possible. Okay. It's okay. like, cause, cause right. hops latent is one of those things. It's like hops latent. You, it, it 100% creeps in, comes in everywhere. It's like if you have, truthfully, hops latent is, is everywhere. I don't know anybody nowadays who doesn't have it unless they're buying in 100% from clean tissue that they know is negative. And even then, I still kind of doubt anytime, anytime scientists call something a viroid, they don't really know where those snippets of RNA are coming from. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's a viroid. Well, yeah, it's a snippet of RNA that you're finding, but it's like, where is it coming from? Like, what is the vector that's bringing in this RNA? But genetic drift, it's a hard thing to even, to even quantify because what you're talking about is something that we can't see. It's like we don't see little tiny mutations. It's like we kind of like we, we're growing a plant and then all of a sudden it, it mutates. It's like majority of mutations aren't visible. Well, it's probably associated with survival, I imagine. It's, it could be a lot of different things or it could be just, just the meristem is degrading just like our telomeres degrade over time, which is how it was always taught to me. It's like we have genetic material all throughout our body. It's like over time, those telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And a lot of people think that this genetic drift is something very similar to that. Well, you have a very old variety. It's being stored in tissue culture, which tissue culture is really just slowing things down is all you're trying to do. I'm trying to slow down the growth of this plant. And the reason why they do it is for this very topic that you're talking about is because of genetic drift. If you take a cutting off of a plant, over and over and over again, okay? There's no way to say that it's not mutating because every time you take a cutting, guess what? You're stressing the plant out. Every time you get a dry down, you're stressing that plant out. Every time that plant gets too much light, every time that plant is underfed, all these different things that technically could be mutagenesis. It's like different types of effects that cause a mutagen to happen. It's like every one of those things and they're all chimeric. So it's like, they're just random just like this random mutation, mm -hmm. all right? And you have no clue where it's coming from. I think when I started hearing that word a lot, it was years ago, but I, I really do think the majority of what people were referring to as genetic drift was just unidentified hop latent virus. Yeah, 100% I agree with you. Because um, in the very beginning, it's like, I didn't deal with hops latent even six years ago. Hops latent, it's like, I didn't see it in most of my crops. It's like, I saw it and then I would see a shitty plant. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. I would, yeah, if I can't curse, I apologize. We can say shit. Okay. It's like if I saw a shitty plant, it was just like any other crop that I was growing at that time. Even when I was in ag, it's like if I saw a shitty plant, well, I'll just throw it away. I was trying to think when I first <laughs> spotted it. I first spotted it in California working in Salinas, mm -hmm. and I want to say it was 2016 mm -hmm. was the first time, but I, nobody was labeling it that. No. You would probably thought like, oh, this is probably just pythium or something affecting I, this I plant. I mean, I, I was like, <laughs> do I have broad mites? Do I have russet mites? It was just, it was very different. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah, the, as... One of the positive and negative things about California's system is people do share genetics here like in an incredible way. Like I'm going from East Coast or any of these other states, like and then walking into any of these big nurseries or retail that has sometimes a retail nursery display is like bigger than some dispensaries in other states, and um, they're doing even bigger numbers than than those dispensaries. And so I had never quite experienced anything like that. I was like, wow, this is so incredible. And so the first thing I did at our big greenhouse was I was like. Go ahead. I'll take everything you got at the store, at the retail, and I took no it. PPE. I took it all, yeah. <laughs> and uh, no cleanliness. And I received it all, mm -hmm. um, and every little issue along with it. But so yeah, it's like a you, blessing and a curse out here because you do spread stuff. Oh, 100 percent. So and quickly in California. I saw it very early on. I saw it seed borne, so it is seed borne. As far as I will tell you, it's like that. It looks like it is seed borne. And that's from my own breeding, my own findings and stuff like that, that you find a small portion of a population. It's like if you use it as a breeding stock, as a mother plant or as a male plant or something like that, to me, it seems like it's seed borne. Seed borne. There's different types of Tabamo viruses. There's different types of viruses out there that are from other industries too, where if the plant is inbred enough, you get kind of like a decrease in vigor so much that it's kind of like, is it seed borne or is it just a really shitty plant kind of thing? But that's kind of where the seed borne mentality comes from. I germinated a lot of seed in my beginning years for the same reason that anybody would. I was trying to develop a portfolio. I was doing my own breeding. I inherently saw it in the very beginning, mostly just because of that. 
I've also, I will tell you, and this isn't, you know, it's, I'm, it's not me tooting my own horn or anything like that, but I've bred a lot of crops and I've bred out virus in a lot of, co in a lot of crops. And simple things like vigor, you can breed out a lot of these viruses. Um, you can just breed a tolerance to them where they instead- Totally, we yeah. see it all the time. Mm -hmm. Big healthy plants, like they're like, yeah, there's, there's, t there's a virus here present, but like when the plant's healthy, you don't see it. Yeah. When the plant's not healthy- You see it. You see it. Mm -hmm. And inbred lines, it's something that's thrown around in cannabis a lot. Like, oh, I'm, I'm inbreeding this, like it's a good thing. My mentor, Ushio Sakazaki, the person that we talked about earlier, everything is inbred, I'm not gonna lie. Even in cannabis, everything's inbred. And anybody who says different is either doesn't know the, re the reality. Now, is cannabis diverse? 100%. It is super diverse. Maybe the, mo the most, oh, right? I mean, yeah, you know, amazing it is that two or three species, depending on who you talk to, two or three species, 300 plus essential oils. It's like you can breed cannabis to freaking smell and taste like anything. Totally. It's a super diverse and all the different types that you see, it's like all the chemotypes and phenotypes that you see, it is crazy how diverse it is. But you can't tell me that when somebody takes Sunset Sherbert and crosses it with everything in their portfolio and then the next person buys their seed and does the same thing with their Sunset Sherbert and the next person does the same thing that that's not inbreeding. You're inbreeding Sunset Sherbert or inbreeding cake or cookies. We were talking about cookies earlier. It's like, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's breeding. But that is what we call inbreeding when you're talking to a geneticist. And sadly, the first thing you see that returns when you outcross to a wild species is vigor on everything. And it's extreme vigor. It's not like... Yeah, hybrid like, extreme vigor. Yeah, like, I've, I've seen it. It's yeah. incredible. So on that note, you can create all kinds of stuff. You can source stuff here. You guys have selected some in-house stuff. You've... Um, You've put it together a portfolio here. What are some cultivars that, if someone hasn't tried your product, like what is like the absolute you must try? I know you mentioned the ChemD is a top seller. ChemD is a top seller. We didn't grow it for a little bit, and we reawakened it just recently. It's like, truthfully, out of our portfolio that most people want to try more than anything is our Judge. Um, it's called the Judge. It's a gold cut, so it's one of our premium flowers. The Judge. It's a high THC. It's a GMO. Um, it's a selection of GMO. I selected five years ago, something like that, from Pack Seed. Um, but believe it or not, it was everything that I wanted it to be. It finishes in under 70 days, which is pretty amazing for what the size of this plant is. It's like, finishes under 70 days, it ripens to a nice purple, it's like has the strongest nose, it hits THC points well above 30, it's like, but it doesn't knock you on your ass, it's more of a nice relaxing high. A lot of those things, that's what I go after personally, is something that doesn't put me in a couch lock that I'm just gonna fall asleep. It's like, I tend to be hybridizing a lot of things with jacks. It's like, so your jack hair types, you know, props to jack hair for all that stuff. A lot of those uplifting terpenaline based varieties are what I go after personally. I'm a lemon lime, you know, orange. People knock on mimosa all the time, but truthfully, it's some of the best flavor on the market. It's like different. I mean, it's so vividly it, unique. Yeah, you know, like, if you taste that, you're like, you know exactly what it mm -hmm. is from the moment it touches your lips. So I love that about cannabis. I absolutely love that there are flavor profiles everywhere. Like right now we were talking about Blue Dream earlier. It's like, I found an original blueberry hybrid. It came from a nursery. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't select it. And we don't sell it in our gold cuts because of it. We sell it in our private stock, but truthfully it's an amazing Blue Dream. It's like got that blueberry nose. It's a nice uplifting, happy high. It's like, you can't really go wrong with it. And it smokes super clean. So talk to me a, bit, a little bit about your lines. Because um, mm -hmm. you've, I know you've got a few different product lines. Some of them are over my shoulder here. But yeah, can you give me a breakdown from kind of, uh, I guess maybe the top to the to the yeah. ancillary products? We <laughs> this is this is where Nick would be the best person to seriously come in here. But what we have is we have a whole bunch of different products. They're all kind of color coded in the way that we produce them. So we have our power line, which is all of our Keef infused or Keef added products. So our power packs, which are smalls. It's an eighth of smalls with a gram of Keef. Um, High-end keef, we produce all our keef here. It's all trimmed in keef. We have power stacks are in that, which are our two and a half grams of ground product with a gram of keef. Once again, it's pre-ground product, just ready to use, essentially. So it's like milled, so it's like a um, roll your own quick. Yep. Roll your own product. And the same thing with power pack. Power packs were made to be, they're in like a little folding pouch, like a tobacco pouch. It was made to be kind of the same indifference. We have our private stock, which is all of our kind of 
they're more heritage varieties in all reality. It's stuff that's been on the market for a long time. It's not bad flower or lesser flower in any way, shape, or form, but that's where you find your Blue Dreams and your Chem Ds and all that kind of yeah, stuff classics. because it's been on the market. And there are amazing selections of these things, so why would we not grow them? Why would we not? I'm not gonna try to recreate Chem D. It's like in this situation, it's a very good plant. We grow it well, let's sell it. It's like, then we have all of our gold cuts. It's like the gold cuts are everything that's bred in-house and selected in-house. Okay, so some of this stuff, we just recently opened it up to outside breeding. So people, and we give props to those people. It's like if I select something from seed that I purchased or seed that I found or something like that, of course I'm gonna give that breeder props because that breeder bred that plant. Yeah, well it's part of the story too. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, not a lot, but I think the heads are curious to know the lineage, the story behind <laughs> it. You know, there's some, it's like knowing the connection or the history of something. It's just, it's interesting. Yep. It's, and it should be fun. It's like, I say in breeding a lot of the times, I cannot breed everything myself. It's like, that's inbreeding. It seriously is. It's like, as breeders or as cultivators, as anybody, you have to rely on other people for something. It's like, and you need to work together because the product's not gonna get any better if we're not working together. I want someone, we had this conversation earlier, and as a breeder, my mentor, once again, I'm gonna bring him up again, Ushio Sakazaki, my mentor, he was the one, he was a person that was very against utility patents hated utility patents. Why? Because it, why would you want to protect something so much that nobody can use it to improve it, to make it better? And the rationale is because it restricts growth? Because it restricts the growth of that thing. And so when we would breed these new innovative products, it's like, why not put them on the market? Let another breeder buy it and breed with it and make his recreation of it. You never know what they're going to create. We've always thought of that as being one of the biggest compliments that a breeder can get. It's um, beautiful. Is someone really wanting is. to work with your work. But yeah, a lot of people are do not feel the same way. No, and a lot of people in cannabis, we haven't got there yet. It's like we haven't reached that point of maturity where like even our own genetics, it's like the genetics that I breed, they're not sold on the open market. Now, would I trade them? Of course I would, 100%. I would trade our best varieties with somebody if I wanted. If I wanted to use your plant for breeding, there would be nothing wrong with that. And it should be open. It, you should be able to discuss these things. Well, in theory, if you collaborate with the right people and create something new that you can both mutually benefit from, it, if anything, it should stir excitement mm -hmm. with the community. Why not? Because you're like, I respect this person, I respect this person. Oh, they got together and did, did a little collab here. I gotta check it out. Mm -hmm. It's like the world, right now cannabis is kind of closed. It's like people are still trying to be the best. And that's okay. Competition is needed. It's like we need to have competition. We need to work together. It's like if we want to change anything for the better, we need to work together. It's like, but the reality is, I think over time, things will change and things will diverge in different ways. I like that you said everyone's trying to be the best because, like, for a long time, everyone was trying to be the biggest. Yeah. And uh, the biggest players are falling out left and right. We won't talk about in <laughs> mul in, in multiple yeah. countries. I mean, it's 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 a thing. You know, these people went huge. I've worked in some of these houses and they're incredible. You're like, oh wow, it's a million square feet. This is such an incredible opportunity. And then, well, that's great, but you had, you spent all this money on your infrastructure mm -hmm. and you didn't spend really any money on genetics and you thought you could just grow whatever. And oh, by the way, your competitor's also growing whatever. Yeah. And now you have no differentiator. I think it's really important to have a divergent portfolio and, and it helps you when you have a divergent portfolio and you know, these trends come, right? These like, these hitters come and it's like, this is the new hype strain, but it, especially in California, it has a short window. Yeah. And you gotta be able to get on the train and then get off the train um, pretty quickly on the West Coast. Now on the East Coast, I've noticed, I look at a lot of trends mm -hmm. and kind of just like pattern recognition. That same hype, hype strain, it might only last maybe a year to 18 months in California. You can ride that thing for three or four years over on the East Coast. So it's, it's just interesting to me how, what a market leader and trendsetter California is for like, the rest of the global industry. And I don't think there's many people that will deny that. No, and I, I agree. Even the even the big guys backing out, the big guys backing out, they backed out of California a lot of the times first because it was so hard to compete with the smaller cultivators or with us, say so say, smaller guys out here. Well, you have a culture that's mm -hmm. so strong in California yeah. that it does not translate really well for corporate cannabis. No. And like, now the East Coast guys, they don't, a lot of them don't have there's, they lack cannabis culture and they know it. And a couple of the good ones have come over and they're trying to bring that 
traditional cannabis culture to their East Coast operations. And I had a discussion with someone on a podcast and it sounds like an easy thing to do, but it's not. It's really difficult because you're just kind of like a noob on a new state that really doesn't have a rich history with that space. No, and even it is it is true, like even our market, how our market demands change so rapidly. We talked about this a little bit. It was one of those things where like even as a breeder, breeding takes time. It always takes time. True innovation is not gonna be a one year turnaround. It's like, can you find some cool stuff in a year? Of course you can. It's like, if you sow a bunch of seeds, you're gonna find something in there that you can grow and trial again and see if it still meets your needs. But even at Claiborne, we get demand for runts and everything else too, because there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the flower. It's like, maybe the plant doesn't yield well. The one selection, whatever the hell selection I'm growing or something like that, maybe it won't yield well, but it doesn't matter. It's in the end, if that's what the consumer wants, you it's, have, it's your job to figure out a yes. way to make it produce that it makes sense. Exactly. And that would be one of those ones that a breeder should be looking at and saying, hey, I have this runs. It's beautiful. It smokes well. It finishes in 56 days. It's like it's everything I want it to be, but it doesn't yield. That would be one of those perfect iconic situations where you're like, hey, I'm going to cross this with a white widow that I have that yields great, that has a, a same fruity profile and blah, 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 blah. And it's like that would be that one where let's get it and look at it now you got to look at probably 500 of them, but it's the same indifference. And that's, that's what we should be talking about and doing. Um, the downfall is, is that it's hard to do. It's hard to do because what's happening is that runts is popular. Like what you're saying, hype strain is popular for about six months. And then, then it's not popular anymore. Well, what's a commercial next? facility, if you get that cut in early, it might take you six or nine months to get it up into actual production. And by the time yeah. you do, you're like, Ooh, I need the next thing. Yeah. It's like, and that's why even our own breeding, our own breeding, I try to focus on new innovative products before I focus on improvements. We work with nurseries. I've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. It's like, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's great nurseries. There's some great there. nurseries in California. Mm -hmm. It's like, and the reality is, is that they're doing good with what they have and it's okay. It's like, if it's product that I trust and know and I understand, there's nothing wrong with taking a product that somebody else has selected and putting it in a jar. You grow it well, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, true innovation, that's technically our goal cuts. Our goal cuts are true innovation. They're new products. Mm -hmm. It's like there's something that, that you haven't seen before or it's something that's like a tried and true for us. It's like the judge, for instance. The judge, yeah, was it selected from a GMO backgrounds? Of course it was, but it doesn't, it's not GMO. It is our interpretation of this plant. Mm -hmm. It's like it was from our own clutch. It was from our genetic profile that we selected over time. Um, and it's grown in your environment. And it's grown in our environment. And it makes it that way. Yep. And it's like, and for all I know, we put that somewhere else, it's not gonna grow the same. Totally, and I think that's why like um, multi-state operators or MSOs really struggle when they're trying to standardize their portfolio across like 18 states, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, eh, it doesn't quite work like that. Oh, you're doing that in a greenhouse, you want it to be the same as your indoor, and can, <laughs> you know, it's like, it just doesn't, doesn't translate. Yeah. That's what, that was really proven winners in a nutshell. It's like, to, to put it into truth, it's like, that's what they did. You know, they sold you Royal Velvet was their blue petunia. I improved it when I left. Mm -hmm. And that plant was the number one selling plant internationally at the time. And it was one of those things where you took that plant, you grew it in a greenhouse, you grew it indoors, you grew it outside. Guess what? It's going to look like that plant. Why did it do that? It's because I bred it. it. Took me seven years to breed it, by the way. It took a long time. Millions of seeds to breed this plant. Millions of seeds. And then it was trialed internationally. It's like it and its siblings trialed internationally at probably 50 different locations. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The reason why it's so stable is because we trialed it at 50 different locations and found that it was stable. Um, that plant is, is one of those things where it's like genetically, that is probably just a stable plant. It's sister siblings, not as genetically stable, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier. It's like maybe they take a, a wider range and they, or a lesser range, and then they get more diverse changes. It's interesting, like my background before all this was like neurology and working with MS communities I told you about. And so I had this like, you know, kind of patient focus, human component to what I was doing before and then switched over to plants. And when I look at both of them and when people, when I, the more I learned about plants, the more I realized they're just like people. Like we're all the same, you know? And so when you mentioned sister, brother, and it's like, I think for people who are like, I don't really understand breeding. And then you mentioned like, hey, do you have a brother or sister? And they're like, yeah, I got two. And they're like, do they look like you? And they're like, 
well, kind of one's kind of tall like me, and then one's kind of like we have the same eyes. But and then one of them, we think we would call her the milkmaid, you know, the milkman's daughter or something, you know. And it, it's just so interesting. It's all just trait expression, and allele dominances. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, whenever I'm struggling to understand the plant world, I find that there's a direct correlation with humans. And when we were talking about older and younger mothers, I always when people are when people are growing really big old moms, the analogy I give them is I say, plants are a lot like people. The older they get, the more susceptible they are to problems. To everything. So if you can hit that vigor curve and cycle them out appropriately, like you will have a stronger stock down the line. And your mother sets a tone for your entire life. You know, how you're nurtured, uh, how you're loved or not loved, or how you're fed, or whatever it might be, um, that sets the stage and the foundation for what you do in the rest of your life. And so the same, I feel, is true for plants. And it's interesting when someone has a struggling garden and they, they're like, you got to focus on her flower room. And I'm like, no, you need to focus on your mother room and your propagation. Because if you can get really healthy mom's really healthy propagation, the rest is, I don't want to call it a coast, but it's a lot better than rebounding from sick moms and sick clones or attempting to. Because mm -hmm. you're already restricted from day one. Yeah. And it's the same thing with us. It's like you have to grow them to a certain age. It's the same thing as humans. It's like you don't want to be taking cuttings off of something that's a week old. It's like even though sometimes you can get decent cutting off of that. But it's it all links up. It all mimics. Yeah. So. Well, I know that cannabis is a never-ending conversation. I could probably talk to you forever, but we do have to wrap this up a little bit. But before we do, and I know that I'll be back and we can continue this conversation and get some of your other teammates in here so it's not all on you. Of course. Where can people find your products? Claiborne is in over 60% of the retail locations in California. Locally, it's always one of the things where I'm a big Empire Gardens fan locally. So it's okay. like they're... Yeah, do you have your, uh, your, your spots you want to shout yeah. out? It's like Remedy Room is another big one for us. It's actually on the way over to LAX for you guys. Okay. Lots of good places to buy Claiborne products. And if you need help finding Claiborne products, you can actually go on the website. So ClaybornCo.com, it's like you can go on there. There's usually a way to, to find a shop if they don't cause problems. It's like Instagram is not a good way to find anywhere to get anything. No, <laughs> and they, I mean, like they're just boot, booting you down. They boot all the good ones down left and right. So, mm -hmm. But uh, ClaybornCo.com. Yep, ClaybornCo.com. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you being a customer of PIP and your time today. And I uh, look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Thank you for everything. All right. Appreciate it, brother. Thanks for listening to Cultivation Elevated. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned are available at pithorticulture.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash cultivation elevated. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.